In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Clarity in the midst of confusion. True religion is saturated by love. True religion is saturated by love. We're looking today at our gospel reading in Mark chapter 12. And as we look at this text, I would first ask you a question. What is religion? What is religion? I used to think going to the dictionary, you know, is in, in elementary school, was some kind of, not magic book, but, I mean, this is the book where you find out what words mean, right? And yet one of the things I didn't understand that, of course, as you've grown or educated, is that dictionaries are compiled and they're re-edited as what? As words change. So there's always this development in what we call etymology. Uh, the language that we speak is dynamic. At one point in the uh, early colonies, they would use the word F in place of S. And there are different ways, and when you would start reading that, if you didn't know it, you'd be like, what's going on? And words would take on different meanings. And, and so when I looked at uh, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary online, this is the definition I found as the first one. What is religion? Religion is a personal set or institutionalized system of religious attitudes, beliefs, and practices. Well, interestingly enough, this idea of a personal set, like, like a religion is a personal thing, is a very, very new concept. Historically, when you talk about the religions of the world, you're not talking about, you know, Sam Sneed down the down the way, who's kind of come up with his own beliefs. It's a set of reli religious beliefs that are formed in community. However they're started, they're formed in community. And when God came to Abraham and led him from the land he was in to Canaan, he said, I'm going to make of you a great people. It was a covenant, but it wasn't just a covenant with Abraham, it was a covenant with us. We're a part of this group. And there's many in American Christianity, and I was raised in a similar kind of thinking, that Christianity isn't a religion, it's a relationship. And it reminds me of C.S. Lewis has said about the simple religions or the simple Christianity. Anyone can be simple when they have no facts to deal with. It's not either or. It isn't a here's religion and we don't want to be that. Here's this. It's true religion. What does it mean to be a follower of Yahweh? It was God's idea and instructions in how to construct the temple and the sacrifices and how the priests and Levites. The idea of religion isn't man's idea. We're made in God's image and we're communal. And so in worshiping God in time, we have the Christian religion. But what is true religion? And today is an encouraging text in that regard. Because while indeed Christianity is a religion, it doesn't separate the personal relationship and the communal one. They're intertwined and they're both central and important. And there is a scribe, a scribe I think sometimes who gets brushed over, that was seeing some deeper things before he met Jesus. God was at work in his people in surprising ways, even though most of Judaism rejected Christ and had a skewed view of who their God really was. True religion is saturated by love. Look at me if you are following along. In Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 28, our reading today. Jesus has had disputes. He's being attacked. He's, he's being challenged. Do you measure up to what we think is orthodoxy, what we think is religion? Or the scribes who came near and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he, Jesus, answered them well, he asked, which commandment is the first of all? And they go into a conversation. 
The question comes after Jesus has earned this man's respect because there was something in his answers. And it reminds me of the text that said when Jesus came, he did not speak like the scribes and the Pharisees, but as one who had authority. When we're arguing from a position of truth connected to the character of God, it holds its own resonance. Because it's not firstly about us or how great my oration is. It's about the truth that sets us free. And this young man was figuring out, and he seems to be asking Jesus a sincere question. Secondly, the greatest commandment. What is it? And Jesus answered, love the Lord thy God with all their heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. But what is love? And when we say this, and of course I've spoken on this before, but it is something you will hear me continually speak on because the definition that most people are getting of love is skewed and selfish and has more to do with how I feel than how I live. That's not the biblical view of love. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart soul and mind and loving your neighbor of yourself, what does that mean? St. Augustine says this, see what we are insisting upon, that the deeds of men are only discerned by the root of love. For many things may be done that have a good appearance and yet proceed not from the root of love. For thorns have flowers. Some actions truly seem rough, savage. Howbeit they are done for the discipline at the bidding of love. Once for all, then, a short precept is given to you. Love, and then do what you will. Whether you hold your peace, through love hold your peace. Whether you cry out, through love cry out. Whether you correct, through love correct. Whether you spare, through love do you spare. Let the root of love be within of this root. Can nothing spring but what is good. Love does not begin or end with a feeling or our feelings. This is huge. And as a priest and as a person called to shepherd and to proclaim God's truth, this is something I face in my own life and as I counsel and shepherd others that I love every week. I feel a certain way, therefore this is right or this is wrong. I receive this a certain way and therefore I've decided that wasn't love or that is love. But as we're looking today in our text, we have to be reminded that that is not how God defines love. Certainly, feelings are never going to be removed from love. We're going to have emotional reactions. We're going to have emotional connection. And those things are part of being made in the image of God. To deny them is to deny how God has made us. But those are not the things we first rely on in deciding a loving action. It is that dog owner who loves this dog so much, you know, and you just can't imagine this dog being in pain, so I won't discipline it. I had a friend who had a dog that they had inherited because the dog had never been trained correctly, and so the owners were like, we don't want this dog anymore. Beautiful dog, pure breed, forgetting the name, but short, very long, floppy ears, just cute as ever and absolutely undisciplined. And I had a friend who was going through this stage that all animals should be able to roam free. And, you know, he was, he was kind of overreacting to his background where his dad was this authoritarian, and so he was kind of raising his kids this way, but his wife would have had none, none of it. She actually used discipline with her kids. But the point is, I'm like, that dog's running all over the place, has no discipline. He goes into your house, does what he wants, urinates, whatever. And I'm like, you know, this, you live in front of a busy street. This dog's going to get killed. And you'll never guess what happened. 
the dog ran out into the street and got killed. It's not about being right. It's not about, wow, I could see that happening. Aren't I a wonderful person? No, it's about the truth and how God made things. If you love somebody who you are overseeing and caring for, it is not loving to be nice. That's about me. But it's also not loving to have a simple judgmental answer for everything and go around harming people and calling that love either. What does he say? There's a time to spare. We're called to be gentle, Paul says, even with those we oppose, even those who may be living in sin. When we, it, it, when we put down our authority or when we have to confront someone that we love or a child or whatever or an animal, we do that, why? Out of a heart of love, not punishment, not vindictiveness. What am I saying? Sorting out what's loving is complicated. It's not easy. And guess what? It doesn't start with how I feel or how you feel. It starts with what does God say love is? What does Christ say that love is? Love engages all of who we are and all of what we do. Love and obedience are intricately linked. Listen to Jesus in John 14. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. Well, I just love God, but you know, I just can't make it to church. I just don't, you, you serve in the body using my gifts. And okay, that's not what Jesus commands. So how are you defining love? And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. John 14, 21. 1 John chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the parent loves the child. That means if we're saying we love God, we're going to love his children. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. I love God, but I just cannot forgive this person. Well, you may have a love for God, but it's skewed. Because if you love God, he says forgive. Now again, that isn't make it easy and that doesn't mean I can reach into my emotions when I get around a person who's deeply hurt me and just go, oh, everything's wonderful. No. But I open my heart because I know I need to forgive not only for that person's good, but for my good and for everybody else connected to that relationship. But forgiveness when you've been deeply hurt is hard. And it takes time for most of us. What does it mean to love? Those are just limited examples. What, what love looks like for you and where you need to grow or where you're strong is going to maybe be very different than for me or the person sitting next to you. Some of us need to calm down and be gracious. Turn away from always trying to judge and fix everyone. And other of us need to come out of the corner and address some things that are happening with people who, who need to hear things because we love them. And somewhere in between. It's context. It's opening our heart to the spirit. But it's also being ready to receive love from other people. And when we receive love from other people, adjust our hearing and adjust our pain and adjust our, our overreactions to the word of God when it talks about what love is. Because somebody may be trying to love us and we don't even realize it. Finally, love is our religion. True religion is saturated by love. Love as our religion, verse 32. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is the one, besides him there is no other, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as himself. This is much more important than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. 
And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. It's amazing not how distant and unapplicable Holy Scripture is to everyday life, but how applicable it is. Because <laughs> the same problems that we face as the church, Judaism in relation to Christ was facing. This young man among the scribes and Pharisees realized that without a true commitment and love for God and one another, all the ceremonial trappings were disconnected and worthless. Did the rest of the scribes get that? No, that's what they focused on. They focused on all this outward, this, that, and the other, while their characters remained skewed and unchanged. That's why Jesus was a problem. His message wasn't simple. His message wasn't always easy to hear. He didn't give people something that made them always feel good. But he gave them the true love of God and modeled it for us. Busy doesn't equal faithful. But being faithful takes a lot of work and commitment and a growing understanding of our priorities in God's kingdom. Productive doesn't mean forgiven or righteous. The ceremonial is empty outside of the genuine love for God and those he puts in our path. Genuine love involves a heart motivated by faith and obedience to the Lord and his calling that we love one another. So let's go back all the way to our introduction, shall we? Christianity isn't a religion, it's a relationship. Where the truth of the reality is an authentic Christianity and a passion for God is important, but so is that ceremony. Because again, the ceremony that was set up and the way that the religion of Israel and then the religion of Christ was set up in covenant was God's idea. He said, I will make a new covenant with you. It was never an abolishment. But you know what we do as humans? One extreme to the other. If religion is hurting people, religion is bad. And if a personal relationship is a problem and individualism is a problem, then we're going to go over to religion and just make it a rote thing that really matters and don't worry about all that caring and loving and faith. Because children like things simple. They want easy, either, or that whole complicated seeking God, trusting him when it makes no sense stuff. Whew, that doesn't build a church. But you know what does build? The kingdom of God. And when a church is, bound, is, a church is, is brought on the very principles and character and revelation of God, the way he has set it up, it becomes more effective, more authentic, and more life-giving from the inside out. We have to work these things together. There are very few either ors that we can take in the scripture, but we take the scripture with the scripture and we continue to be faithful. True religion is saturated by love. The great commandment helps us understand the central responses of the Christian faith. Who we are, what we think, how we feel, and what we do. When we contextualize the entirety of our lives by the love of God, we taste and embrace the eternity we will someday know completely. May our gracious Lord Jesus Christ enable and empower us to live into and live out the love of God that others may know this Christ we serve and the hope of salvation. Thanks be to God.